Okay, take a, we're going to take a break again tonight, maybe because of, primarily because of Phil Led, uh, maybe because of some of the things that we experienced in the last couple of days. I'll talk to you again about prayer, and I'll ask you to take your Bibles and turn with Matthew to Matthew chapter 6. Several years back, I did a series of sermons on Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is not a sermon from that series. Uh, in fact, it's almost a totally different thought, not a totally, but a different thought from, 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 from what I looked at then. I, when, when we look at prayer, think about with me for a moment. When, when we look at prayer, what is the basic, you don't have to answer out loud, but what is the basic foundation of prayer? I have said, I've heard many of you say, we believe in prayer. Well, that might be a good statement, but there's a better statement. We believe in the God of prayer. Amen? Prayer was what? Prayer was God's will. The foundation of prayer, the, the basic motivation is what we really believe about God. If we have a weak view of God, then we'll have a weak prayer life. If we have a strong view of God, then we'll have a strong prayer life. If we believe that God's our only hope, then we will get in our prayer closet. If we believe that politics is our hope, then we'll go to the polls. Don't get me wrong. We ought to go to the polls. No, I'm not saying, not, don't, don't go out and say, Brother Bob said, don't go to the polls. But I'm telling you, our, the hope in America is not next Tuesday or November 6th. Uh, I personally believe that God is humbling America, and I believe that things are going to continue to get a whole lot worse. I believe that the foundation of prayer is what we believe about God. And I believe that Matthew chapter 6 begins with the thought of us understanding the sovereignty and the character of God. So when we say the sovereignty of God, in some circles... That raises a red flag because one of the favorite phrases of those who believe in the doc, a strong doctrine of predestination, of Calvinism, of, of, of whatever word you want to use, they, they, they say, we believe that God is sovereign. But for those of us who have somewhat of a knowledge of the, uh, of, uh, of the doctrine of election, the doctrine of a predestination, the doctrine of what you, I believe in the sovereignty of God. In fact, to say that you don't believe in the sovereignty of God would be a foolish statement because the, so, meaning, the, the meaning of the sovereignty of God is that we believe that God is supreme, that God is independent. We do not add anything to God. God is God whether we, knew, whether we know him or not. Amen? God is sovereign. I believe that all of us believe and acknowledge the sovereignty of God. By saying that God is sovereign, it is saying that we believe that God rules over all. Most everybody believe that. But I believe that we not only need to look at the sovereignty of God, but the character of God. And I believe that our generation, listen closely, I believe that our generation is losing the biblical character of God. And it's our fault. I believe that some of the phrases and some of the, 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 the emphasis that we have had in church are, are good and we meant them good, but I believe that maybe they're being turned and not being thought of as good. For example... We want people to believe, we want people to feel at home at church. 
Well, if a lost person comes to the house of God, listen closely, they don't know Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives and the Holy Spirit of God gets a hold of them and begins to bring forth conviction and they leave without accepting Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, they not going to be happy. And I believe that the basic character of God that is missing in our day is the character of God being holy. Look with me. When you pray in verse 5, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue. By the way, they love to pray. They love to see. They love people to hear them pray rather than see the God of prayer. We can be guilty of that. I've been guilty of it. I've heard some of your phrases in prayers, and I'm thinking, boy, I like that. I need to use that next time. Standing in the synagogue and on the corners, corner, corner, the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. And surely I say unto you, they have your, their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many works. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. In this matter, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus taught us to begin our prayers with an affirmation of the holiness of God. Now get this. When we truly see how holy God is, the next step we see is how sinful we are. Had people say, I'm not worthy to talk to God. You may not have been prior to salvation, but if you have come to salvation in Christ, God has made you worthy, and it is a slap in the face of God Almighty to say you're not worthy to talk to God. You look in the Bible, and you will find in most, if not all divine encounters of God in the Bible, the very first attribute of God recognized by those who came into his presence was his holiness. Do you remember when Moses saw the burning bush on Mount Horeb? Do you remember when he heard that voice? He says, do not come near. Remove your sandals from off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Did you get it? Prayer is not necessarily a gimme, 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 gimme session. When we pray, we're not praying our will, we're praying His will. And I think that too many times in our prayer closets, we bring our pride and our arrogance and our own selfishness in our prayer closets and we forget that it's holy ground. Do you remember when Isaiah had the vision of God? Do you remember that recorded in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3? When Isaiah had that encounter with God in the temple, the seraphim cried out, holy, holy, holy. Holy, Lord God Almighty. Do you remember what Isaiah did? He ran around, jumped, and shouted, Hallelujah. He raised his hand in worship. No. He fell down prostrate. You read that literally. Search me, God. See, I'm, I'm talking about, doesn't say it this way. If you can use a sinful man like me, here I am, Lord, use me. Send me. Talked about one of the preachers yesterday that a 
a God-fearing church is a sending church. Archie Mason, pastor at Central Baptist Church in Jonesboro, talked about how hard sometimes it is to be a sending church. I've told you about their recent encounter in 1st of September of starting a church in Paragool. One of the biggest problems of Central Baptist Church in Paragool, excuse me, Central Baptist Church in Jonesboro is they don't have enough space for people to worship. And they discovered that from Paragool, which is probably 10, 15 miles away, that they had 750 members that were driving from Paragool to Jonesboro to church. So they began to survey and ask, if we started a church in Jonesboro, would you go to church, excuse me, if we'll start a church in Paragool, would you go to Paragool to church? And then he asked the question, could you imagine what it would be like to lose 750 members? Could you imagine what it would feel like? This is where it hits home to a lot of churches. To lose $10,000 a week in offerings. Half a million dollars a year. Could you imagine? But yet they stepped out on faith. And since they stepped out on faith, since the 9th of September is when they started the first church, started the church, had, has, has had over 50 professions of faith. Sending church, sending to Nebraska, sending to the Delta, sending to our world missions offering, giving of ourselves and others to the winning the world with the gospel, sending to celebrate recovery in Chrissy's house, sending to, 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 to Renewal Ranch, sending to, to Green Acre, sending to Terrace Meadows, sending our, our whole congregation, ascending out into a lost and dying world. Lord, 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 here we are. Send us. We recognize your holiness. D do you remember Daniel when he prayed? Daniel chapter 9. Do you remember how Daniel knew? It, it's written there how that Daniel knew that he could not pray apart from God's righteousness. And he prayed in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 7, he says, righteousness belongs to thee. Righteousness belongs to you, O God. Appealing to the righteousness of God. In fact, you read, continue to read in that prayer. He says, O Lord, for your sake. What are we doing today? Average Southern Baptist Church, average church in America, God, our people are, are declining. We're, they're going somewhere else. We're losing them. Oh, Lord, for our sakes. Lord, that we can meet budget. Send us people. God, God, that we can, so God, that we can grow. God, send us people. Do you see how selfish that is? Lord, for your honor. Lord, for your glory. And, and sometimes you hear of churches in our community and our area, area, area winning people to Christ and maybe we get mad because they're bigger than us. Shame, <coughs> shame on you. Each person represents a soul. And it's not for us, it's for him. Do you remember Peter recognized the, all, the when, when Peter recognized the awesome identity of the Lord Jesus, he, he fell down at Jesus' feet and he cried out in Luke chapter 5 and verse 8, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. You see, we must be constantly, listen, in prayer, we must be constantly aware of the holiness of God. At the same time, that God is holy, what some would think to be the exact opposite, uh, the, the exact opposite side of, of God's character is that because God is holy and He can't stand sin and, he, and God can't stand sin, then 
he would not have mercy towards sinners. But aren't you thankful that at the very same time that God is merci- that God is holy, God is also merciful? The book of James, chapter 5 and verse 11. Scriptures record, but behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen of the Lord that the Lord is very pitiful and full of mercy. He's patient. He's full of mercy. Do you ever get impatient? You ever get impatient with people? You ever given up some or some? Aren't you thankful God doesn't? Many of the Psalms, as they sing, they sing with beautiful lyrics of the attracting aspect of the nature of God being merciful. The 86th Psalm, the 15th verse, But thou, O Lord, Art a God full of compassion and gracious and long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 148, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 10, describes the extent to which God will forgive sin. He says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sin, nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us because of his mercy. Turn with me in your Bibles, not my notes, but we're going to read it anyway. Turn with me in your Bibles to the 136th Psalm. 136th Psalm, the Scripture records... I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who, who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heaven for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night for his mercy endures forever. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn for his mercy endures forever and brought out Israel from among them for his mercy endures forever with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm for his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two two, for his mercy endures forever and made Israel pass through the midst of it for his mercy endures forever and overthrew Pharaoh Uh, 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 and his army in the Red Sea for his mercy endures forever to him who led his people through the wilderness for his mercy endures forever to him who struck down great kings for his mercy endures forever and slew famous kings for his mercy endures forever Sihon king of the Amorites for his mercy endures forever and Og king of Bashan for his mercy endures forever and gave their land as a heritage for his mercy endures forever a heritage to Israel his servant for his mercy endures forever who remembered us in our low estate, lowly estate, for his mercy endures forever, and rescued us from his enemies, for his mercy endures forever, who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. I've got a question. I realize probably none of you have ter- taken sermon preparation. But do you, what do you get the idea that the psalmist is trying to get out in this verse? His mercy endures forever. I mean, it doesn't take a scholar. You don't have to have the Hebrew language. In fact, in 26 verses, 
He says 26 times, his mercy endures forever. Nothing outlasts the mercy of God. We appeal to God's holiness. We understand that it is illogical for the child of God to understand any other thing other than that God is plenteous in mercy. I remember two years ago, I believe his name was Michael at Terrytown, told about 10 or 12 of us, I can't be saved. Feel this tumor in my stomach. I've got less than a year to live. I've been on drugs. I've been in alcohol. I'm a sinful person. I can't be saved. We kept going back. He went to the popcorn popper. We witnessed to him. Went in the hamburger line. We witnessed to him. He went over by the basketball goal. We witnessed to him. Do not quit. Someone asked Dr. Gray or Allison, president of Mid-America Seminary, uh, our evangelism professor. They said, Dr. Gray, how many times do we ask someone, do they want to be saved? He said, until they say yes. Kept on, kept on, kept on. I preached the gospel, and I said something like this. If you want to be saved tonight, and Michael hollered, I want to be saved right now. He hollered out loud, I want to be saved right now. I don't want to wait. I want to be saved right now. And I said, now, brother, calm down. We can get to you in just a few minutes. No. Terry Fleener went over and knelt down beside him. He prayed to receive Christ as Lord and Savior of his life. Why? Because his mercy endures forever. The implication is this. The truth is this. God's wealthy in mercy. All of you have heard about whoever it was in South Carolina that won the, that won the $1.6 billion dollars. Tell me that if he takes cash, it's, going only, it's only going to be like $978 million. Don't you feel sorry for him? Do you know what happens to a lot of those guys and gals who win the lottery? They go through it quick. They got uncles and aunts and cousins and nephews and nieces. People that hated their guts now talk about how much they love them. Before long, they spend it out. Don't have a dime. Do you know what? We can never outspend the mercy of God. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how far you have drifted. His mercy endures forever. You see, prayer has no meaning unless it takes into account God's nature. That his mercy endures forever. We give up. We just quit. First person that I had a burden for when I, was a, when I got saved was a man by the name of Terry, young teenager by the name of Terry Turner. And I probably abused it because just about every week on Thursday I'd go to Terry's house and I'd witness to him. He told a friend of mine, would you tell Bob to quit coming? I guess I was just stupid, but I quit. He moved off to Mississippi. When he moved off to Mississippi, there was another Bob in Mississippi. <laughs> may, may not have been his name, but he kept on going. Before long, Terry got saved. He came back to Dice and looked me up and said, Bob, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what's that? He said, I done went and got saved. You know why? It's not because Bob was faithful and true. Almost as if Bob gave up. God's mercy endures forever. God's merciful. He understands and he cares about human need. Most of the prayers of the biblical characters, God took the initiative. 
God started in your life. It is God that takes the initiative. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. What causes us to ask? God takes the initiative. The greatest saints have always known almost intuitively from the depth of spiritual nature that God desires to provide for his own. I remember that Abraham assured Isaac that as he was preparing to ascend Mount Moriah, and Isaac asked the question, I don't see the sacrifice. And Abraham responded, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Don't you know God's going to always provide? Now, he, may not always pro he may not always provide the way that we think he should, but aren't you thankful that he does it? Aren't you thankful that he does it his way? You see, only those who grasp the truth that God is concerned about the human need can cry out, the Lord is my shepherd. In Psalm 23 or Psalm 123, 121 verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. Don't you know that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of redemption? He's got a lot invested in you. He's got himself invested in you. He's got his son invested in you. The blood of his son invested in you. God cares for you, and God cares for me supremely. Do you remember Matthew chapter 6? If God so arrays the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more do, does he for you, O oh, ye of little faith? Do you remember Sunday morning talking about the hair follicles? 100,000 hair follicles on our head and God is concerned about every hair on your head of over 180 billion people that live on the face of the earth. Therefore, we cry out, our Father, hallowed be thy name. It's not about me. It's not about us. But it's about him. God, what do you need to do in my life to bring glory and honor and praise? He, he continues that Matthew passage that I read a few moments ago in Matthew chapter 7 in verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? I've always loved bacon. I don't know many people who don't love bacon. We almost eat our weight in bacon. If I've known anybody that loves bacon more than I love bacon, it'd been Andy. And I used to, when we'd eat, I, I'd give him the bacon off my plate because I enjoyed watching him eat bacon better than I enjoyed me eating bacon. And he told me here a while back, Dad, I finally, and I told him that, son, I really, I'd rather watch you. He told me the other day, Dad, I know what you're talking about now. Because I see little Hudson loving things, and I'd rather watch him eat it. God delights in us eating of the grace and mercy of his love. God's love for us is infinite. The Bible provides us with other characteristics of God that would bring us closer to him. The Bible tells us that, that God is our shepherd, that God is our keeper, that God is our refuge, that God is our strength, that God is our son, God is our shield, God is our all. But God is one who watches over us. Jesus establishes in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, 
the nearness of God. You see, if he is our brother and we are his brothers and sisters, then eventually that brother and sister may end, but he's our father forever. Amen? I feel like I realize our brothers and sisters in the flesh die. Our fathers in the flesh die, but he forever throughout all eternity is our father. You see, it would almost exhaust the language to, to clarify for us how caring God is. Have you ever been around someone and they, you knew they had a need and you just didn't know what to do or what to say, but when it come to find out that you really didn't need to do anything, you really didn't need to say anything, but you just needed to be there? You know what I'm saying? Aren't you thankful that the Scripture says that God never leaves us, nor does God ever forsake us? thought about when we were in Nicaragua and we were being evacuated and they started throwing blocks at our bus. I really wish, I really, really wish that I could sit here before you and say with truthfulness, I wasn't scared. But I was. But at the same time that I scared, I just had the peace of God of knowing God says I've got this. It's almost, almost as if, I didn't say this, didn't even pray this. You saw the biggest rock you got, boy. That'd been haughty. God's got it. You believe God's got your life? Pray like God's got it. Quit worrying about things you have no control over. God's got it. And God will meet the need in your life and in my life for His glory. And when He meets it for His glory, we know it is for our good. So when you pray, He says, pray our Father, which art in heaven, holy is your name. And I surrender myself completely and totally to your Lordship. Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. I can't figure it out. I praise God I can't figure it out, but I just know you are. And I'm going to just sit back and enjoy by faith and see how you work it out for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. Father, I thank you for today, for the opportunity to gather in your house. And I thank you, Lord, for how you have worked my life, how you've spoken this week, how you've spoken clearly, pointedly, personally. Lord, I, I just pray that in the coming days that uh, as we seek you with all of our hearts and with all that we are, Lord, Lord, Lord I pray that each and every one of us would be attentive and that we'd listen closely to you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I've got an assignment. <coughs> I want you to read carefully for Sunday morning. Joshua 12, 13, and 14. Now, the, I, I, th this, is my, this is my point. You're going to get bogged down in chapter 12 and 13. Don't, don't, don't you scoot ahead and go to 14 without going 12 and 13. You're going to get bogged down. You can't say some of those names. Just do the best you can. Read through it. Come expecting God to speak powerfully and personally in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.